Indeed, O oh Lord, you are great. You are great. You are great, O oh Lord. Great is your faithfulness. Why don't you just take this opportunity to just pray to your maker, pray to your God, pray to the one who loves you unconditionally, the one in whom you live and breathe and exist, the creator of you and your spouse, the creator of you and your children, the creator of you and your future spouse, in case you're not married, just take this opportunity and worship the Lord. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know which season you are in. I don't know how tricky things are. I don't know how good things are, but you know, and the Lord knows. And so worship the Lord, worship the Lord. Oh God, we exhort you. Oh Lord, we enthrone you, we enthrone you, we enthrone you, oh Lord. We thank you so much, so much, oh Lord, for the gift of life, so much for the gift of salvation, so much for the gift of prayer. We thank you, oh Lord, for your loving kindness. We thank you, oh Lord, and we worship you. We exalt your holy name, our oh Father. Thank you, thank you for being so gracious to us. Thank you for loving on us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for showering, for showering us with grace and favor. Thank you, O oh Lord, that we exist today, the first day of the month of October, the year 2024. We don't take it for granted, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, our helper. Holy Spirit, our helper. We call upon you to move in this seminar, to speak to us, to reveal truth to us, to rebuke us, to convict us, to teach us, to mold us, to encourage us, to reinvigorate us, to inspire us. Speak, speak, speak and bring about the healing we need. Bring about the growth that we need. Bring about the wisdom that we need. Bring about the wholeness that we need. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for your help. Have your way. Have your way, our Lord. Have your way. We surrender to you. And we pray that, Lord, you may soften our hearts to receive from you. Keep our ego from rejecting the truth. Keep our ego, oh Lord, for being hard when you're speaking to us. Have your way, oh Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed, trusting and believing. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for keeping time. Whichever part of the world you are tuning in, Africa, the American continent, Middle East, Europe, Australia. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Dayan Masinde. I shall be your speaker today, your relationship coach and counselor. Allow me to just um, uh, share the screen. Allow me to just share the screen and then we continue. We continue. Um, so yes, as you can get to see, we do this every first, second, and third of the month. And we are in the month of October. We're in the month of October, the first day, day one. We do this every first, second, and third. If today is your first time, welcome. If you're a regular, also, by all means, welcome. Thank you for coming on board. Our host, Gift Zawadi Love, will not be on video today, but she will be there with us tomorrow, God willing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for tuning in as we get to have today's uh, talk. So we are, we are looking at love after infidelity, pain and storms, pain and storms. We're doing marriage God's way. And we appreciate that here, we've got people who are married, people who are dating, people who are single, or people who are even in a complicated situation. So we are here to just learn how to do marriage God's way. And this is a very important topic because it is happening. This is the reality on the ground. Infidelity is happening. So we're going to look at it from a very holistic perspective. So in case it hasn't happened in your marriage, we're here also to learn so that it does not happen or what to do in case it does. We are not wishing any harm. We are just here to inform so that we can be able to operate with wisdom. So these are some of the statements that people say regarding infidelity in marriage. I thought he or she is a Christian. How could he do that? How could she do that? Some people say cheating is my non-negotiable, my non-negotiable. Uh, if somebody cheats, I'm out. If somebody cheats, I am leaving. If my spouse cheats, I am done. Some of the phrases that are being spoken about cheating. 
he or she vowed they will never cheat and here they are they've done it they've done it by the time you two are coming together your spouse vowed to you you can you you uh, you know i can perhaps i can do many things but the one thing i will never do is cheat on you or he or she hurt me just like my ex maybe your ex hurt you through cheating and here you are your current spouse the spouse that you're with has done the same and then also there's another very common phrase once a cheater always a cheater so these are some of the phrases and we're here to look at infidelity in great context and remember we are not here to condemn we're not here to make you feel bad we're not here to um uh, to put you down we are here to bring about wisdom and healing so let us continue so infidelity, infidelity is the act or fact of having a romantic or sexual relationship with someone other than one, one's husband, wife, or partner. So that is what infidelity is about. You know, you're having something romantic or even sexual. It's, a, it's something romantic or sexual with someone other than your spouse, other than your spouse. So that's the definition of infidelity, the definition of infidelity. And as usual, if we have any questions, please feel free to write in your questions and then we shall tackle them at the end of the presentation. Love after infidelity through the pain and the storms. So there are two types of infidelity. There is perceived and then there is real infidelity. Perceived infidelity and real infidelity. Perceived infidelity is when you act in a manner that makes your spouse think that you are cheating. But actually, you're not cheating. So, but there's a way you carry yourself that is creating some ideas. It's creating some ideas. Maybe the way you talk to other people, your lack of accountability, the way you light up whenever you engage uh, another person outside over there. So, you are not cheating, but there's a manner that you're doing that you're carrying forward. Sometimes, when it could be nowadays, you no longer touch your spouse. So, there's no sex in the marriage, and your spouse is wondering. Isn't your body uh, warming up? Like, what is going on? I'm here right next to you, naked, and it's been two months since you touched me. What is going on? So perceived infidelity. You seem very comfortable, you know, talking to somebody else and you're talking to that person, you know, for an extended period of time. And I'm wondering what is going on? What is going on? Could there be something more happening? So that's perceived infidelity, where you are not cheating, but the way you're acting is causing your spouse to think that you are this perceived in infidelity. And then there's real infidelity. Real infidelity is when you're, act you're actually cheating on your spouse and your spouse has actually found out. So either we, your spouse has found out and there's evidence, or even if your spouse hasn't found out, you're actually doing it. Now that's real infidelity. You yourself know whether you're doing it or not. Well, whether your spouse knows or, do, or doesn't know, you know what you're doing. So that's real infidelity. So that's cheating on your spouse. And in some situations, your spouse is actually found out with evidence. So there's perceived infidelity and real infidelity. So we're going to look at a video. We're going to look at a video, which is a, an acting scene from a, mu a music video of some, some years back. So just pay attention to the words of the video. It's not like I'm sleeping with the person. It's not like I'm, I'm not cheating. It's not like I'm sleeping with them. It's not like I'm, I'm sleeping with them. So that's one of the statements that people make when they get caught in infidelity. It's not like I'm, it's like I'm, I'm cheating. Uh, I haven't slept with the person. It's not like we've had penetrative sex. It's not like we've gone to bed together. So you're excusing it. And this is why it is important for us to look at the different forms of infidelity. So many people think it's only sexual, but there are different forms. You're going to look at six of them. The first one is sexual infidelity. So this is having sexual intercourse or sexual activity with someone not your spouse. So you've actually uh, are engaging in sexual activity, whether it is penetrative sex, whether it is, you know, what licking each other, touching each other, you know, those kind of stuff that give you sexual pleasure. So that's sexual infidelity. Uh, now, that's what people, most people think infidelity is, but it's not the only type of infidelity. And then you've got number two, physical infidelity. This is when you are fondling, you know, you're touching, you're giving touch pleasure, or you're hugging in an intimate way, somebody that is not your spouse. So there's a certain way you hug that individual, your spouse is looking and going like, 
I, it is not right. And even when your spouse is not looking, you yourself know you're too close with this individual. You're touching this, this person who's not your spouse in a rather intimate way. So that is physical intimacy, where there's a way you're touching and you're holding and you're fondling and you're, you know, you're, you're giving some touch pleasure to this individual. You haven't had sexual activity, but then your physical closeness is off for a married person. Then we go to emotional. So this is when you are investing, if investing in an emotional connection. You are enjoying this connection. In fact, you're looking forward to bonding with this individual, this individual of the opposite gender. You are attending to the to to uh, you know to the intimate needs, to the intimate needs you know of somebody that's not your spouse. So you're flirting with them. You're making them feel special. So you are bonding with this individual emotionally. Maybe you haven't even met. Maybe you're doing it online. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this person is in a different county or a different country, so you haven't met this person. So there's no likelihood, even perhaps, of you two meeting. But there's a certain way you're talking. You talk with this individual on a regular basis and very intimate stuff. So you are enjoying this bond. You're enjoying this bond. And for some, actually, this is the most painful, the emotional one, where you are deeply invested emotionally in the life of a part of another person and that person is deeply invested in you yet you are married and with a spouse so that's emotional infidelity you know and then there's number four social infidelity so this is when you're planning intimate time you know you're being close to that individual you publicly whenever you go for events you go for a road trip you go for a safari you go to this event you the one person you're looking forward to going with them is that individual not your spouse so you look forward to being around that person publicly, you know, engaging with that person publicly, you know, you you, you light up whenever you realize that person is actually, you know, uh, in, in an event or somewhere or whenever you go to a church service, you look forward to seeing that individual because you get to, you know, exchange uh, eye to eye and just interact. So that's social infidelity, you, you're bonding and connecting more and you would love to create time, social time with this individual individual who is not your spouse, the opposite gender. And then you've got financial infidelity. So this is when you're supporting or you're investing in someone of the opposite gender. You're giving them money or you're investing finances into them. You're making sure their rent gets paid. You're making sure they get to eat. You're making sure that the dreams succeed. You're putting in this investment. You're buying them gifts, buying them that uh, tie, buying them that dress, putting in the work. You are financially investing into something and you are doing this behind your spouse's back. Meaning if your spouse was to know what you're doing, you know your spouse will not be comfortable. So this is not charity. This is not helping somebody in need because if you are helping somebody in need, you will actually be very comfortable to involve your spouse. But for some reason, you're doing it behind your spouse's back. You are enjoying financially giving to this individual of the opposite gender who is not your spouse. And then if we go, go to spiritual intimacy, Spiritual intimacy is even though you have a partner, your spouse is born again, your spouse is a Christian, your spouse is prayerful, your spouse looks forward to praying with you, but no, no, no. Instead of you wanting to do that with your spouse, you're doing this more with that person of the opposite gender. You're leaning more, you're depending more of your spiritual nourishment from this person of the opposite gender for that spiritual connection. You're looking for, they've become your prayer partner, but the more you to pray, the more emotionally connected you are because most of these prayers are intimate prayers. You're bonding more intimately. So you're sharing more of what is going on in your life. Somebody of the opposite gender, you're connecting. So that's spiritual infidelity and yet, you have a spouse that you can be praying with. You have a spouse that you can be saying, hey, my, my husband, my wife, why don't you help me pray with this? But rather, you're having intimate spiritual time with another individual. So you've looked at different forms of infidelity. So this is just to debunk that line. It's not like I'm sleeping with him or I'm sleeping with her. There are different forms of infidelity. 
Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 reads, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Remember, we're not here to condemn. We're not here to make you feel bad. We're here to talk about this thing, to shine light into what is happening to marriages so that we can be better doing marriage God's way. Infidelity with someone of the, of the same gender. You know, the other example that we've given is somebody of the opposite gender. But let's be honest. There are some people who are also cheating with their spouse with somebody of the same gender. If it's a husband, he's getting close with a fellow man in an intimate way. If it's a wife, she's getting close with another woman in an intimate way. And maybe this is a lifestyle they had before marriage or a lifestyle they are growing into. So we have to also shed light into that. So sometimes you might be cheating with someone of the same gender. How do you know? You call the person intimate names, very intimate names, very intimate names that belong to a lover, names that belong to a lover. You share intimate same-sex content. So somehow on your WhatsApp, on your, on your Instagram, on your Facebook Messenger, on your Telegram, or whatever app that you use to communicate, you're sharing same-sex content, perhaps of people kissing, perhaps of, you know what, let's look at, you know, jokes of this particular nature. So you're sharing that with this person of the same sex. These are intimate same-sex content that you're sharing. Why are you doing that yet you're married? Number three, you share nudes of yourself. If you're a man, you're sending a photo of your penis to this other man. If you're a woman, you're sending photos of your chest, of your nipples, of your vagina, of your clitoris to this other woman. Why are you sending nudes to, in, to, to, to make somebody feel aroused? You're having phone sex. You're having these particular in, uh, incidences with somebody of the same gender. We are here to shed light. This happens in some marriages. You are comfortable sleeping intimately on the same bed with them you know it's one thing to for example like you've gotten somebody who's come to visit but then you know because you have got limited space or you've gone for like a, a get together and there are many of you so you're sleeping on the same bed but this is different this is you're sleeping intimately with that individual of the same sex um and you know it's it, it's a red flag and then you protect them more than you protect your spouse so you will protect that individual of the same sex more than you're protecting your spouse you can also get to the point where you have sexual activity with them people, some people are doing this in their marriage and being married to somebody of the opposite gender is a, it can be a good mask for you to do this kind of activities where people on the outside see you as heterosexual where you're married to you know in the in the way people people like people uh, have, are used to but behind the scenes you're having sexual activity with somebody of the same sex so we are looking at infidelity love after infidelity so in case you've got any questions please feel free and then we shall be addressing them at the tail end of the presentation so what leads people to be unfaithful? We are here to be honest. Remember, we are here to learn. We are not judging. We are not uh, condoning. We are not um, justifying. We are here to just learn. Whether it's happened in your marriage or it hasn't happened so that you prevent it from happening or become aware. Number one, neglect. Neglect. When you're feeling that your needs are not paid attention to by your spouse, you feel neglected. You feel neglected and it leaves you being exposed. Number two, rejection. Rejection. Your spouse turns down your emotional or sexual advances. You try and have a date with your spouse, your spouse turns you down. You try and touch your spouse, your spouse turns you down. You try and flirt with your spouse, you don't get a reply. You try and become emotionally bonded with your spouse, it doesn't go the way you want. You really try and you end up feeling emotionally and sexually rejected. So there you are, it's left you exposed. So we're looking at what leads to unfaithfulness. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse three to five reminds us, their husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. 
do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent both of you have consented we are going to deprive each other and for a time it's not for an extended long period of time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer then come together again so that satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self control this is the danger of rejecting your spouse, the danger of neglecting your spouse. We're looking at uh, what leads people to be unfaithful. Number three, lustful habit. Lustful habit. You have a tendency of desiring, ogling over and flirting with other people easily. You do the, you just find yourself doing it easily that you, are, you acquired this habit either before marriage or in marriage. Remember in the previous seminars, you've talked about, you know, you can marry someone with no red flags and then they acquire red flags in marriage. So this is a lustful habit. Somebody passes, you want to look at, you know, their buttocks. Somebody passes, you want to look at how that man is packed in his pants. Somebody passes, you want to admire. Those, those, those are lustful habits. You find yourself lusting over one individual after another. At the workplace, you're there making very sexual jokes because you are lasting after different individuals in church instead of you paying attention to worship you're looking at how somebody looks like as they lift up their hands and then their chest is all out you can actually see all this kind of stuff so there you are you are lasting you have a lustful habit number four revenge revenge so perhaps your spouse cheated on you or you perceived that they did cheat remember we talked about two types of infidelity there's perceived infidelity and real infidelity so let's say you are operating on the perceived infidelity so you perceive your spouse cheated on you and you're mad and now you want to cheat you know so that you can even the score or you have evidence of your spouse cheating on you and you're like i want to do it too so that he or she can feel the pain that i feel so that i can punish my spouse. So revenge is another reason why people end up becoming unfaithful in marriage. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans, who do not know God. So the Bible is encouraging us not to operate on lust and also not to operate on revenge. Control your body. Just because you're mad doesn't mean now, oh, I'm now going to give out my body to somebody else, which is the, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are being told. Number five, we're looking at reasons why people become unfaithful in marriage. Number five, marrying someone you don't connect with. So you got married to somebody and you married this person perhaps because you got a child together and you're like, okay, now that you've, you've, you've become parents, I might as well marry you. I was not feeling you. We had a sexual encounter. You got pregnant or you impregnated me. Well, you know what? Let's just get married. So you don't connect to this person, but you just married them because you got a child together. So you haven't learned to build an emotional bond. Or you are poor. Maybe you grew up in poverty. You were going through a difficult time at that time. And then you found this person who was able to take care of your needs. And so you perhaps moved in with them or you agreed to marry them so you're not connecting with this individual so it was poverty that led you to connect with this person you are poor you were just looking for somebody who can be able to take care of your bills take care of you you found one you married them now that you're inside this marriage you're like i actually don't feel this person i don't connect with this person Another reason, you know, uh, marrying somebody you're not connected with is because of family or societal pressure. So there you are, you, maybe your family, your parents are pressuring you, when are you going to get married? Time is, 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 is passing, you need to act, you need to do something. Or you felt as a society, you're looking at your peers, your contemporaries, they've gotten married, they're now on their second child, their children are now going to school and doing stuff and you're like, hey, I'm being left behind. So you married quickly because of pressure. Or you married out of pity, you were feeling sorry for this person, or this person perhaps even threatened, if you're going to leave me, I'm going to commit suicide, I don't know how to live without you, and all those stuff. So you married this person out of pity, not out of desire, love, commitment, and inner conviction. So this can lead you also to being unfaithful in your marriage, because you are unfulfilled. Another reason why people become unfaithful in marriage is company. When you hang around people who celebrate or who encourage cheating, 
you might cheat not that you will you might because they're encouraging it you know they're telling you hey why don't you consider that person hey we are also doing it ah, it's nothing serious it's you you're still committed to your wife you're still committed to your husband you're paying the bills yeah but sometimes have fun have fun your spouse is bringing you problems by all means come just let it lose let, uh, i'll even pay for you uh, to go to a hotel and be able to have some good time as your friend so bad company corrupts good morals so bad company can also be a reason why some people cheat in their marriage number seven alcohol or drugs you know when you're high you're not uh, you're not sober so you don't have proper judgment and so you end up uh, sleeping around you find yourself waking up next to somebody in bed that you barely know you find yourself doing things that you know what are regrettable you're there you're partying in the club somebody's coming to grind on you you're feeling their butt pressing on you you're getting excited before you know it your there's this song that was sung by a musician i want to make love in the club there you are you're making love in the club and and you're doing these things because you're caught up in the heat of the moment, you know. So you lack judgment because you're high. So that's another reason why some people actually uh, end up end up becoming unfaithful. Another reason is lack of boundaries. You don't know how to put boundaries. You don't know how to turn down people, and so it leads you to trouble. It leads you to trouble. You 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 don't know how to say no. Somebody comes at you. You don't know how to push back. You don't know how to put the fences around your marriage. You don't know how to make that stand that I am a husband, I am a wife, I don't do this thing. So people have got an easy access to you. They know that, you know what, I can call you, you're there. I can bond with you, you're there. I can touch you, you will Google, you, you will giggle, and then you give me some, some, some of your goods. Number nine, false accusations. False accusations. So maybe you have a spouse, your spouse is accusing you of cheating. So there you are, you're thinking, okay, since I'm being accused of cheating, I might as well do it. So false accusation is another reason why some people are actually ending up cheating. It is not right. We're just looking at the reasons why, so that now we can get to address it. Number 10, porn addiction, porn addiction. So you have trained your mind that it is okay to desire multiple people. So you're, the thing about porn is that it trains your mind. Today, you're going to desire this porn star. Tomorrow, you're going to desire that porn star. The other day, you're going to desire that other porn star. So you're going to, so you're training your mind. It's okay. It's okay to desire different people. You know, on Wednesday, it was this one. On Saturday, it's on another person. So once your mind has already adjusted to that, to thinking like that, now in real life, your mind is going to scout for the next person in real life. Like, oh, check out that person. I like their butt. Check out that person. I like their muscles. Check out that person. They, you know, so you find out that you want to actually actualize your fantasies. You actually want to actualize your fantasies. So porn addiction, porn addiction. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whether it is her or he, you know, this is also for women, you know, when you're last, when you're looking at that individual and wanting them, desiring them sexually, you're actually uh, doing that. You're actually uh, doing that. You're actually lasting over. You're actually lasting over. So very important for us to be able to remember that, for us to remember that. So even when it comes to being falsely accused, just because your spouse has called you a dog doesn't mean you start acting like a dog. Just because your spouse has said, hey, you're cheating, you're a cheater, doesn't now mean you confirm that and actually start doing that. Please be a person of integrity. Love yourself enough not to fall for false accusations. I know it hurts. I know it hurts when your spouse is, you know, passing judgment on you that is not right, that is unfair. But please, please love yourself enough to be like, that is not me. You know what? You can think the worst of me, but that is not me. But also look at yourself. Are you doing some things that have created perceived infidelity? Remember, we talked about two different types of infidelity, perceived infidelity and uh, a real infidelity. So also check yourself before you get mad that you're being accused falsely. Check. Am I doing something that might make my spouse think so? Number 11 stronger emotional bond so you have met someone who matches your energy this person matches your conversations they match your naughtiness your vibe Whew. 
you feeling this person even more than your spouse you know so you bond you you're, you're connecting more with this person and so you you have you have a stronger emotional bond with this person because simply they are matching you try to be naughty with your spouse but your spouse is just not matching your level but outside there this individual is matching your naughtiness matching your conversations matching your favorite topic matching your vibe number 12 extended time at work so you're spending so much of your awake and, uh, and active time at work. And when you're at work, you get to see people at their best. People bring their best at the workplace. They will dress their best. They will act their best. They will bring, bring in their A game. So that can be very attractive, considering you're spending hours with this individual. So that can easily also be a door to unfaithfulness because you're seeing this person at their best. Whilst at, at, at home, you're seeing your spouse perhaps, you know, both at, both, both at his or her best and also at their worst. So that is the illusion of somebody at the workplace. You're seeing them at, at their best. Number 13, marital issues. When you're having problems in your marriage, so you're not, you're, you're having issues in your marriage, it can make you to drift apart. And once you drift apart, it makes you more susceptible to fall into temptation. The likelihood of you falling into temptation when you're having marital issues are high. Another reason why people end up becoming unfaithful in marriage. This is why we encourage people, solve your marital issues quickly. Solve issues quickly. Don't prolong them. Don't keep pushing them down the, down the road. Deal with them. Number 14, seduction. Seduction, another reason why people fall into, uh, into uh, become unfaithful. So you have been trapped by somebody who is strategic, calculated in attracting you. This person is after you, either because they want to hurt your spouse, they, why they, want, they, they, they just want to have fun, you know, nothing serious, they just want to have fun, or they selfishly admire what you have with your spouse. They're looking at you and your spouse, they're like, hey, you guys are really, really good. I want some of that. So you're falling into their seduction. Proverbs 5, verse 3 to 4 reads, for the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey. And even the adulterous man. Eh? So whenever you see woman, doesn't just mean women are guilty of seduction. Even men can be seductive, you know. They drip honey. And her speech or his speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she or he is bitter as girl, sharp as a double-edged sword. Remember that. Number 15. Long distance marriage. So this is especially people who are in a long distance marriage. You know? And especially if you lack self-control, if you lack that self-discipline to stay committed from afar, you can also end up into being unfaithful. We are looking at the reasons of why people become unfaithful. We've looked at 15 reasons. Now, why is infidelity so painful? We've looked at uh, different forms of infidelity, why it happens. Now we're going to look at why is it so painful? Number one, it involves lies or secrets. Whenever you're doing these things, you're doing them you know, uh, behind the scenes. No one has to know. So your spouse feels like a fool that you did things behind his or her back. So it makes your spouse feel like a fool. Number two, it makes the one cheated on doubt or blame themselves. Now your spouse wondering, why did you do that? Why did you emotionally connect with another person? Why did you have sex with another person? Why do you touch this other person like that? Am I not good enough? Am I not good enough? So it makes your spouse doubt him or herself. Number three, it feels like a stab in the back. Because you see, infidelity shakes the loyalty, you know, it shakes the loyalty. So your spouse feels like either you shared loyalty, yes, you are partly with me, but partly also with that other person, or you are even more loyal to that other person than to me. You know, you did them, some stuff to that other person more than you did for me. So it, start, it feels like a stab in the back. Number four, it shakes the foundation of the marriage. You just feel shaken. You wonder, especially if the cheating is a long-term affair, you know, it's been happening for weeks, for months, for years. So you start to wonder, it shakes the foundation. It also makes one question the whole marriage. So your spouse is wondering, what is this that you've been doing all these years? Like, what have, what have we been building all these years? What is going on? Number six, it damages trust. So it makes your spouse question your words and your actions. So that's why, that's why it is very, very painful. Number seven, it can lead to lasting triggers and suspicions. So for some time, your spouse might be suspicious 
of even your innocent deeds and words. You do something innocent, you don't mean harm, you actually are very, you're, you're being a good spouse, but because of past infidelity, now it's become, you know, your spouse is suspicious. Uh, you've done something for your spouse, you've bought your spouse a gift, your spouse is wondering, oh my goodness, do you really mean this? What actually is happening? You're having great sex, your spouse is wondering, okay, the sex that you're having, did, this, did that other person teach you this style? So you start to think about all these things. Eh? And then number eight, it can affect the sex life of the marriage so your spouse will have this image of you giving your body to another person which can affect the sex life which can affect the sex life so stop before you get caught maybe you have been cheating but you have not been found out maybe you have not been found out stop it stop it now stop this behavior stop this whether it's been sexual cheating financial infidelity emotional infidelity physical infidelity uh, social infidelity spiritual infidelity whatever it has been stop it now because this is one of the questions a spouse asks when when they find out their partner has cheated you are only sorry because you got caught you're not really sorry you're only sorry because you got caught or they ask themselves, if I never caught you, will you still continue cheating? So he or she is asking himself that question. Don't put your spouse through that. Don't put your spouse through that. Stop it. Now, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 to 23. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? or another woman, or another man? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord. The Lord is watching, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will die led astray by their own great folly. And death over here doesn't necessarily mean physical death. You can die physically. You, you can die emotionally. You can die spiritually. You can die financially. You can die in various ways. So can a marriage survive and thrive after infidelity? Remember, we are not here to belittle infidelity. As you're talking about this, we're not belittling it. We're not give, excusing it. You're not justifying it. But rather, we are being real and honest about what is happening in society. Because as you've seen, we're being holistic, not just looking at the sexual infidelity, but the emotional, the financial, the social, the physical, the spiritual. Now, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what next? You've caught your spouse cheating, or you're, you've been caught cheating. What next? You have three choices. Number one, maintain the status quo. So this is a very bad option. This is a very bad option, and I will not encourage it. Maintaining the status quo. You know, so it leads to more pain. It leads to resentment. It leads to emotional and physical sickness. You can get emotionally sick because of the stress, or even physically sick because emotional issues can bring about physical sickness, or even sexually transmitted diseases. It can damage intimacy. It can waste opportunities and prolong conflicts. Or number two, option number two, we're looking at, you know, so if infidelity has happened, what do you do? Option number two, you can end the marriage. Especially if you choose to end the marriage, perhaps because of rampant infidelity. Your spouse is just cheating and cheating and cheating with no remorse, no regard, doesn't care. And then you're like, you know what? I cannot take this. In case you do choose this option, still work on your healing and forgive your spouse. If not, you're going to be a bitter, divorced person who is a slave to past pain. So forgive. Even if you're going to divorce, forgive so that now you show up in your best state even after the marriage has ended. Remember, we're talking about if you've decided to end the marriage. You're looking at the options. And then you've got option number three. Heal, repair, and nurture the marriage to a better season. This is another option. So in case you choose this option, remember that it is possible. If you both work on it and you are intentional, you are empathetic and supportive and patient with each other. So you've got option number three. So when inf infidelity happens, remember you've got three options. Maintain the status quo, end the marriage, or heal, repair, and nurture the marriage to a better season. So we're going to look at uh, Psalm chapter 147, verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That is God. So can God uh, heal a marriage that's been shattered by infidelity? Oh, yes. If you allow God to move in it. And we are now going to look at the ways of doing it. 
So how to heal, repair, and nurture after perceived infidelity. Remember, we looked at two different types of infidelity. There's perceived infidelity and real infidelity. Perceived is that you haven't cheated, but you've acted in a manner that your spouse thinks that you've been cheating. So how do you do it? You're going to look at the one who created the perception of cheating first, and then the one who believed that cheating has actually occurred. So what do you do? So if you're the one who created the perception of cheating, what do you do? You acknowledge how your behavior created the perception of infidelity. I am sorry, my wife. I'm sorry, my husband. I understand how whatever it is that I've done can look like I was cheating. I'm, I acknowledge. I acknowledge my behavior. Instead of being defensive or dismissive, explain yourself. You know what? When, when, when I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I've, I've not been explaining where I'm, I, I am. You know what? I perhaps I, I, I used to think like because I'm an adult, I don't need to be explaining myself. Or I'm sorry that I've been working overtime and you know it's been making you feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry that I've been giving this woman a right to work without telling you. I'm sorry for the explain yourself. Apologize for making your spouse insecure. I'm sorry that I've made you insecure. I understand how my actions have contributed to you feeling insecure. Please forgive me. Apologize for neglecting your spouse or focusing somewhere else. If your spouse has been feeling neglected, you're not spending time with me, but you're spending time with this person at the workplace. You're spending time, I see you, uh, you know, you're there when your neighbor needs help, you're there to help our neighbor. When you, you know, I, it's just, I, I, please, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my, my wife. I'm sorry, my husband. Please forgive me for neglecting. You know, instead of spending so much time with you, I've been spending time perhaps with this friend. Or I've been spending, I've been there for this particular person, maybe because they lost a loved one. So there I was, I was planning for their funeral, like I dedicated myself to that. Yet you needed me because you were pregnant. Yet you needed me perhaps because, okay, you uh, you just lost your job. And so here I am, I, I gave myself so much to this other individual and I forgot about you. Forgive me. Give special treatment to your spouse. Just shower your spouse with special treatment. You know, you've been neglecting. Now shower your spouse with special treatment. Make your spouse food special. Cut off or minimize contact with the person who your spouse or the people your spouse is uncomfortable with. So you know what? Maybe minimize the time you're spending with them because at the end of the day, you are not cheating. So you're like, okay, let me minimize so that I don't create this perception. Let me minimize. Or even if you have to, you can even cut off. You can be like, okay, if this is making my spouse uncomfortable, if perhaps there you are, you're thinking, it's okay to befriend your ex. And so you've been there for your ex because you're thinking, I'm, I'm done with my ex. It's not like we have anything. But you see your spouse is being affected. Your spouse is wondering, why are you spending so much time with your ex? Why are you having coffee uh, coffee, uh, co coffee meetings with your ex, perhaps weekly? So to you, you're doing nothing wrong, but to your spouse, you're like, no, this is, this is not right. So you, if you need to cut off, also cut off. Give information. Be, give information. Let your spouse know what you're doing, you know, and with who. Uh, it, it, when, you, when there's a lack of information or sufficient information, it can foster mistrust. So be accountable. Let your spouse know what you're doing and where you're at. Treat your spouse well and special in private and also in public. Don't make the mistake of you're treating your spouse good only publicly, but privately you're not treating your spouse well. No, love should shine first privately before it glows publicly. So treat your spouse well in public and in private. Put boundaries because you saw that one of the ways that people end up, you know, creating trouble is they don't know how to put boundaries. So put boundaries. Learn to, you know, put a stop when people are. You, so somebody comes into your inbox and and says, "Hi, hi, sexy, hi, beautiful, hi, gorgeous, uh, hi, darling, hi, sweetheart." And there you are there, you're continuing the conversation. And then your spouse sees this conversation and you didn't put boundaries. You didn't tell that person, hey, I'll appreciate if you address me in a different way. I am a married man, I'm a married woman. So learn to put boundaries. Allow your spouse to ask you questions and answer without a temper. Don't feel defensive when you're giving an answer. If your spouse needs to know something, okay, at, at the end of the day, you're not doing anything wrong. So when your spouse is asking you questions, please give answers. Uh, what about the one who perceives cheating? If you're the one who perceives cheating has occurred, what do you do? Remember, this we're look, looking at perceived infidelity. Perceived infidelity is cheating hasn't happened, but your spouse has been doing things that have made you perceive that cheating has happened. So if you're the one who perceives cheating has occurred, has occurred what do you do? Avoid accusing falsely. You have no evidence of cheating. You have nothing. 
So why are you saying it as if it's a fact? Why are you saying that he or she is cheating as, as if it's a fact? Do not accuse falsely. Do not accuse anyone falsely. It's part of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Number uh, The next one, know that your gut can be wrong. So maybe you're saying, oh, I've got this gut feeling, but sometimes your gut feeling can be wrong. Sometimes your gut feeling are informed by your pasts, fears, or your trauma, or your bias towards people. You got married thinking all men are dogs. You got married thinking women are, you know, just, uh, you know, you can't trust women, fear women. So you, you have this, this already informed bias, and then your gut is running with it. So check on that. Know that your gut can be wrong. Don't con conclude cheating just because you feel uncomfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, communicate to your spouse. Hey, I'm uncomfortable how you interact with so and so and so. I'm uncomfortable how, you know, you, you don't tell me like what actually is uh, where you're going and who you're with. I'm uncomfortable how you give this person a right to work and you didn't tell me. Communicate that you're uncomfortable instead of concluding you are cheating. Work on your self-esteem. Work on your self-esteem to avoid unnecessarily being insecure. When you have a low self-esteem, even when you see your spouse laughing at a joke of another person, you think they're cheating. Even when your spouse just has a conversation with somebody on the phone, you're like, oh, they're cheating with that, with that person. Even when your spouse is trying to be a kind-hearted individual, you're like, oh, why are you kind to that person? You must be cheating on them. So work on your self-esteem. Allow your spouse to explain themselves. When you're feeling uncomfortable about something and you've presented it to your spouse, allow your spouse to explain themselves like, hey, I see where you're coming from. Although, let me give you my perspective. The reason why this has happened is because of X, Y, Z. Yes, for the, for the past two months, I've been working extra hard. My, my time at work has been extended. My wrong is I did not inform, inform you and involved you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. So allow your spouse to explain. Do not become the judge and the prosecutor all at once. You're like, you're guilty and I've judged you. This is a verdict. Please don't do that. Be open-minded. Be open-minded. When you're having conversations, have conversations that, that you enter into without a fixed conclusion. You're just there. We're just going to have a conversation. I'm not having any conclusions as we are having this discussion. The next one, communicate your needs to your spouse. Communicate your, your needs to your spouse. How you would make your, uh, you want your spouse to make you feel secure. For example, you know, if you do X, Y, Z, it is, it's actually going to make me feel good. It's going to make me feel comfortable. Communicate to your spouse how your spouse can make you feel secure instead of you throwing it through the roof and accusing your spouse of cheating. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 reminds us, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins and dare I say, including the sin of infidelity. Remember, we are not here to say, to justify, to excuse. We're not here to belittle uh, infidelity. We are here to offer solutions. And God, Jesus is the answer. If it has happened, or if in case it ever happens to your marriage, it can be repaired if you both choose to. Now we're going to look at how to heal, repair, and nurture after real infidelity. We're looking at perceived infidelity where infidelity hasn't occurred, but you've acted in a manner in which your spouse think you have been cheating. Now we're going to look at real infidelity, that cheating has occurred. There's, a, there's actually even evidence. You know very well you've been cheating. Your spouse knows you've been cheating. How do you do it? So we're going to look at the one who cheated, what they need to do, and next also the one who's been cheated on. So the one who cheated, don't try to cover up yet your spouse already know you did or are doing it. So in case you, you, you know very well, don't try to cover up. Your spouse already knows it. So don't try to cover up. The more you try to cover up, the more you're standing in the way of healing and repairing and nurturing your marriage. Don't brush it off. Don't be like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm done. I stopped it. No, 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 don't brush it off. Face the difficult work of dealing with your choices. Don't push it, uh, you know, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, it was just, I just had one, two, I, I just slept with them two times, you know, and then you just brush it off like it's, like it's just some, you, as if you're just passing by the supermarket to just buy a, a, a packet of milk. No, don't brush it off. Next, don't blame your spouse or what lacked in the marriage for doing it. Don't go like, okay, I cheated because, you know, you're not giving it to me. I cheated because, you know what, you're, you're, you're difficult to be with. I cheated because, no, 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 no. Many people have gone through marital issues, but they haven't cheated. The reason why you cheated was because you chose to. 
You chose to. You willingly chose to. So take responsibility. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your spouse and be like, oh, I just have No, no, I, I did this. It's all on me. You did not make me do this. It was not your fault. The blame is not on you. It's not because, okay, you are pregnant and so you're not attending to my needs and so I cheated. Or because, okay, uh, my husband, you know, when you are, you are going through this, I was not connected with you. So you are the reason why I cheated or, you know, the way you spoke to me. So I cheated because of, you no, know, do not blame your spouse. Take responsibility for it. I did this. It's all on me. Give your spouse time to grieve. Be patient. Be patient. Don't rush your spouse. Give your time, time to grieve. Remember, your, your spouse is grieving the fact that I trusted you. For the years we've been together, I've never thought you would do this to me, and then it has happened. And grieving takes time. When you've lost a loved one and you've buried them, you, we don't expect you to heal quickly and automatically. Day two, we are like, what is going on? You should be laughing right now. No, grieving takes time. So allow your spouse to grieve a season in your marriage that has been lost. Because right now you're going to enter into a season of, okay, we're going to, now we're building marriage after infidelity. This is a new season. The season we are in before was a season whereby I thought you would never cheat. You thought I would never cheat. And now we're in a different season. So allow your spouse to grieve. Shed some light on what happened uh, if your spouse is, is interested. In case your spouse wants to know, okay, tell me, what happened, how it all happened, you know, because of X, Y, Z. Remember I was working, uh, I, I was working in this particular place. I got comfort, I got so uh, close to this individual and then it happened. Remember when, when I was going on holiday and then this and this happened, I got a bit high and then I did this. Remember at a, a, in church service when I was praying with this particular individual, I started praying with them, we got very, very close and then it happened. So in case your spouse wants to know, give information so that it can help in terms of closure. Ask for an apology, even if even if your spouse will not accept it, you just say sorry. I'm sorry. Your spouse may not even accept that apology, but at least let them hear from you. I am sorry. And not just a blank I'm sorry. I'm sorry specifically. I am sorry for cheating you. I am sorry for going behind your back. I'm sorry for shaking things in our marriage. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Repent and forgive your spouse. Repent and forgive your spouse. Repent and forgive your spouse. You know what? If your spouse has hurt you in a certain way also, forgive your spouse. Spend time near your spouse. Don't become distant. In case you're the one who's cheated, you've hurt your spouse, don't now do the uh, pull away and now you're no longer around your spouse because you're scared of your spouse. Now you're no longer coming home early. You're no longer, you, when your spouse is coming to the bedroom, you go down to the living room. Yet you're the one who brought this problem. So please spend time near your spouse. Even if it's going to be difficult, just be around your spouse. Even if your spouse is not going to speak, just be around. Just show your spouse, you know what? We are healing. I have hurt you and we are healing. We are healing. I'll, I'll be here. You can shout at me. You can talk to me anyhow. You can what? No, I will take full responsibility. I did this to you. Serve and take care of your spouse's needs. Just be there. Whatever it is that your spouse needs, you know, I'll go to the market, I'll buy for you that one. I will make for you that food. I will do this. I will I will iron your clothes whenever you're going for a meeting. I will do this kind of stuff. You know what? I will just attend to your spouse's needs without even your spouse asking. It's a way of showing your spouse, hey, I still want us to be close. Be gentle when your spouse shows you anger. In case your spouse perhaps, uh, you know, has those relapses or have, has, a, has a trigger moment whereby they just end up, you know, lashing at you, you answer back gently. Remember, you're the reason why this is happening. So answer back gently. Cut off habits or company that make you susceptible to cheat. If it's alcohol, if it's a company that you've been keeping, if you've been hanging around people who do not respect marriage, cut them off, cut those habits, cut those habits and be like, you know what, no more. These things are actually leading me into hurting my spouse. Be accountable, be open with your phone. You know, when you're touching your phone and then your spouse is looking uncomfortable, be like, okay, if your spouse even wants to just go through your phone, you know what, you can go through my phone. And when your spouse is going through your phone, let your spouse find out, okay, you're putting boundaries, you're telling off people, your spouse is not going there and seeing deleted messages. You're not, is your spouse not going over there and seeing, you know, you're acting fishy, money being sent to different people and all kind of stuff. No, let it be that your spouse can be like, okay, you, you're accountable and be accountable. Be clear where you're going and who you're going with. Just be like, hey, this is where I'm going. And when your spouse is asking questions, be like, hey, just, uh, just so you know, I'm, at, uh, I'm in a meeting, I'll be coming home at around 10, I'll be coming home at around 12, I'll be coming home at around eight. You know, just be accountable and say, I'm with so-and-so and so, be accountable. Thank your spouse for being patient with you. Tell your spouse, thank you. I know it's not easy. I know I've hurt you, but thank you for being patient with me. 
create new memories. You know, try to create memories, play a game, watch a movie, go for a walk, go for a, a, a trip, a holiday, have a good laugh, just try and create new memories. Don't let it be that every single time you're just talking about what has happened or you're constantly just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Create new memories. Do things that make your spouse proud. You go out there and shine. Shine in the public. Do stuff. If you're serving in church, go ahead and shine in church. Go ahead and shine in the community. Be like, okay, let's go ahead and just bless. Maybe uh, my, my darling husband, my darling wife, what are you doing over the weekend? Let's go to a children's home and just bless people. And then your spouse will see you living in a way that is that he or she can actually say, you know what? I'm proud of you. You make me proud. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be associated with you. Don't make your spouse feel like he or she is competing with another for your attention. Don't make your spouse feel like that. Like, hey, your spouse has to defend and protect and beg you for attention. No, you give it, give it, give it, give it in full measure. Don't rush your spouse into having sex. So there you are, you are like, you want to have sex quickly and yet you're the one who's cheated on your spouse. Please don't do that. Focus first on building emotional intimacy more than sexual intimacy. Build friendship. Build friendship, connect, bond, play games, interact, ask each other nice questions in the WhatsApp group that uh, we have for uh, Holy Ghost Impartation Ministries. I sent some healing questions uh, last month. I'm gonna send them some. Uh, I'm gonna send them again uh, this month in case you miss them. So ask each other these healing questions. Build friendship. Build your spouse's compliments, uh, confidence through compliments. Let your spouse know, hey, you're amazing. You look good. Even if your spouse is not going to receive, you just give it. You just give it. They will. They will store it in their mind. Initiate the process of therapy if you hit a wall. In case you're struggling as a couple, be like, hey, my wife, my husband, why don't we go through therapy? And be the one who initiates because you're the one who's caused the pain. Show intentionality. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. If you've, if you've hurt your spouse, also forgive yourself. It's not easy. You're also hurting. You feel bad that your spouse is crying because of you. So forgive yourself. Cut off the one you cheated with, cut them off. If you cannot, perhaps because it is somebody that you're working with, you know, at the workplace, put strong boundaries and let your spouse know that, hey, you put bond, uh, uh, strong boundaries. Do things that demonstrate to your spouse that you have told the other person that it is over. Whether you're going to call the person you've cheated with in the presence of your spouse to tell them, hey, you know what? My spouse found out or my spouse knows about us and I'm sorry for what it is that we'll be doing and this thing needs to end, please. Uh, it, it's done. Let your spouse know that you've ended it and your spouse is there when you actually declaring it has ended. Avoid doing suspicious things. So avoid doing things that, you know, that cause suspicion in your spouse. You know what you've been doing that has been bringing suspicions. You know the things that your spouse has been raising as a red, red flag. Stop doing them. Romans, Romans um, chapter 8 verse uh, that, uh, it, it says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is to encourage anyone who has cheated or who's uh, cheating, or who has a spouse who's actually cheated. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even that act that you've done. Nothing can separate us. And we're looking at how we can repair. Now, what does the one who was cheated on do? What We've looked at what the one who was cheated should do. Now, what should the one who was cheated on do? Choose whether you are ending or building the marriage. So you decide. Remember, we've got three options. Status quo, which is not good, end the marriage, or heal and nurture and repair the marriage. So if in case you've chosen heal, repair, and nurture the marriage, then be pro-marriage. Be focused. Now I'm staying and I'm here 100%. We are doing this. Express your heart. Express it. Don't suppress. Don't suppress your heart. Tell your spouse, you know what? I really, really felt hurt. When you did this, when I found out about this, it was very, very terrible. And if you want to even express it even in counseling so that now a counselor can help you moderate your emotions, by all means, feel free. Hear your spouse out. When your spouse is expressing, remember, when your spouse is communicating, they're not trying to justify why they did what they did. And your spouse is also hurting just as you. So hear your spouse out when your spouse is engaging in conversations. Don't block your spouse. Don't put up a wall. Just hear your spouse. Remember how far you both have come. Remember how far you both have come. You've, you both have come a long way. Remember the journey. Appreciate the effort your spouse makes to repair. 
If your spouse is putting in the work, please notice that work. Please appreciate that work. Don't take it for, for granted. Don't take it lightly. Appreciate. Thank you. I see you. I see you really working hard. I see you've taken us through therapy. I see you're doing this. I see you're, 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 you're more present these days. And I see you and I thank you for it. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with your spouse. Healing takes time. You're not going to rush it. Communicate to your spouse how you want trust to be won. Your trust has been broken. So how do you want your trust, your spouse to win back your trust? Is it perhaps, do you want more of uh, time together? Do you want dates? Do you want more phone calls? Do you want more accountability? What exactly do you need in order to trust your spouse again? Participate in counseling. In case your spouse asks you, hey, let's go for counseling, go. Don't throw cold water uh, at it. You know what? Let's go. Let's do this. In case your spouse is, and even when you go for counseling, participate. Be there. Remember, you've decided to make it work. So be pro-marriage. Pray for and with your spouse. It will help to soften your heart and to forgive. You know, pray together. Pray with your spouse. And we don't pray because you feel like it. We pray because it is necessary, because we need God. So don't wait until you feel like praying. No, you push yourself and be like, I will pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I am going to pray. Participate in forming new memories and conversations. You be there, you participate. If you're going out on a date, you go out on a date. If it's going out on a safari, you go on, on a safari. If it's, you know what, playing a game, you play a game. If it's watching a movie, you participate. You be, Remember, you've decided you are healing, repairing, and nurturing the relationship. Address also the areas you have hurt your spouse or let down your marriage. You, why? Because this is an opportunity to address the marriage holistically. Don't just focus on the cheating. Maybe perhaps there's a way you speak to your spouse that is not right. Maybe you um, have been neglecting your spouse sexually before even the infidelity happened. Maybe you have a way of being disrespectful. Maybe you have a way of demeaning your spouse. Maybe you have been lacking to appreciate and celebrate your spouse, even outside of the infidelity. So for the areas where you have fallen short, take responsibility for that and be like, hey, now that you are repairing the marriage, let's do it holistically. I am sorry for how I let you down. I'm sorry for how I hurt you. I am sorry that you know you felt you felt and you felt like you're not being seen in this marriage. You felt unappreciated. I will work on that. Let this season be a new season to repair the marriage holistically. Don't just focus on you cheated, you cheated, you cheated. Also look at yes, you cheated. Maybe perhaps we can work on our communication. Maybe I need to respect you more. Maybe I need to appreciate you more so that you address the marriage holistically. So it is possible to make things right. It is very, very possible to make things right. The grace of God is sufficient. God is there to help you to, to nourish you to, to build with you to, to repair the marriage if you both want it. So you heal the marriage, first of all, emotionally, connect well, bond well, interact well, get to talk heart to heart, get to forgive each other. Then you heal spiritually. You pray together, you fellowship together, you study the word of God. You can even study, you know, what about reconciliation. For example, just a Bible study. Let's do a Bible study on reconciliation. Let's do a Bible study on healing. You know, you can be able to be like, okay, now let's heal the marriage spiritually. Let's heal the marriage also financially. You know what? Let's now be open and transparent how we spend our money so that I don't end up sending money to somebody else. Let's be open and transparent financially. Then socially. Let's now go publicly and interact. Let's go out on dates. Let's engage. Let, let you feel that I, that I love you publicly and also privately, that I celebrate you, that we are there, we are doing this. Let's also build and heal the marriage physically. Let's be cuddling. Let's be hugging. Let me stop hugging somebody else in a very intimate manner that makes you feel uncomfortable. Let's also heal physically. And then lastly, let's heal sexually. It might take a while, maybe today the sex might not be so great, but maybe a few, uh, three days three days next is going to be amazing, and then we get to learn each other sexually. And by the way, day three, we are going to look at sexually balanced marriage, a sexually balanced marriage. You don't want to miss that one. We're going to look at how you can balance sex in your marriage. So healing sexually, we're going to address that in day three. Tomorrow, we are going to look at midlife crisis because this is happening. People are going through midlife crisis, and as they go through midlife crisis, they are dropping their ball in their marriage. They are questioning their marriage. They are destroying their marriage. You don't want to miss 
day two tomorrow as we address midlife crisis and how it is affecting marriages. Whether you are the ages of between 35, going into the age of 55, that 20 year window, a lot is happening in marriages between that time. And we're going to address it tomorrow. Whether you are that day age or you're already there or even you're past there, please join in tomorrow so we can see what happens, what might happen or what is happening during the midlife and your marriage, day two. Day three, we're going to look at sexually balanced. Now we're going to look at this song uh, that I recorded and that I wrote, dedicated to any couple who are going through a challenge. It is not over. You can return back to your first love. Worldwide. You know the fact. I remember when we used to smile when we had together good days. Darling, we had. Then the storm came. We lost the rhythm and the fire. I miss the days. Darling, we shared. I want to be in a love that's true. I want to feel the way lovers do. I want to look upon your eyes and then my heart skips a beat. Let's come together and make this dream come true. So I'm coming back to you, back to you, my love. Oh, I'm coming back to you, back to you, my love. Say you feel the same, tired of these games. Oh, I'm coming back to you. Back to you, my love. I wonder what I'm gonna do if I will lose you. I do my best to make you stay. Surrender all your fears and all your questions. We cannot waste another chance. Mm, live with me, cry with me, laugh with me, baby, dance with me, sing with me, grow with me, sleep with me, baby, eat with me, fight for me, pray for me, bend you ever knew what the money, nobody makes me feel the things you do to me, back to you, back to you, my love. Coming back to you, back to you, my love. Say you feel the same, tired of these games. Oh, I'm coming back to you, back to you, my love. May you return back to your first love. May you find healing in your marriage, regardless of the pain or the storm that you're going through. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. May your marriage find healing. May you return back to your first love. May you restore whatever has been broken. May you repair whatever is damaged in your marriage. The grace of the Lord is sufficient. Do not do it by your own strength. Tap into the help that comes from the Holy Spirit. So thank you very much for tuning in to day one of Marriage God's Way. We are looking at, today we are looking at love after infidelity. And so thank you very much for tuning in. Tomorrow we are going to look at day two, a midlife crisis and marriage. You don't want to miss that. And then day three, we are going to look at sexually balanced, how you can have a sexually balanced marriage. And so we're going to look at the questions. I can see there's so many questions over here. Uh, somebody says, and hello, my first time here, and I'm grateful. I'm learning. Thank you so much for that feedback. We much appreciated. Thank you, Pastor, for speaking in a way that felt personal to me. I am in need of therapy right now. Thank you so much for writing that. By all means, get in touch if you need therapy. If you need therapy, uh, the number is plus 254-721-590954. That is plus 254-721-590954. 590954. Get in touch if you need any uh, support when it comes to your marriage. Uh, do not walk through this alone. Whatever it is that has happened, whether you're the one who's brought the pain to your marriage or your spouse is the one who's brought the pain to your marriage or you bought, you've brought the pain to your marriage together, 
please don't go through it alone. So that's plus 254-721-590954. As you can see, the number is over there displayed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, praying that uh, God is going to come through in case you have any, whatever it is that you are feeling uh, challenged in your marriage. Let's look at the other questions. Let's look at the other questions. Somebody else is saying, my spouse has always been moving out of marriage, always emotionally drained so much for so long. Very important question. Let me tell you this. There is something in counseling we call trauma responses. We all have got different trauma responses. When something uncomfortable happens in life, people respond in either of these four ways when they have an unresolved trauma. They, they respond in either of these four ways. The first way they do it is fight. People who fight, they tend to be shouty. They tend to come at you. Some even throw something at you. They will slap you. So that, that's a fight trauma response. The second response is flight trauma response. Flight is somebody who takes off. When things get difficult, they take off. They don't want to be there. They take off. They excuse themselves. They go. When it gets difficult, they just fly. That's a flight response. And then the third one is freeze. People who operate in the freeze trauma response, they just freeze there. They just freeze. They, they don't say anything. They're not going anywhere, but they're not engaging in conversations. They're not participating in anything. They're just frozen. You know, this person is, you, you feel, they feel like a mountain that you want to move. They're not going anywhere. They're still in that marriage. They're not going anywhere. They come home every single day. They're there, but you, you're just not getting anything from them. And then the fourth one is phone. Phone, that's F-A-W-N. People who operate on the phone trauma response, they will appease you to make you feel good even if they don't mean it. They will tell you, I'm sorry, even if they're not sorry. They will tell you, yes, I did it, even if they, they did not do it. They will tell you, okay, they will laugh with you, but deep inside, they are unhappy. So that's a phone trauma response. So maybe your spouse is operating in the flight response, moving out of marriage, always emotionally drained, you know? So maybe that is what is happening. To be wonderful to find out a few things. Number one, how did your spouse grow up? What happened in their childhood or their teenagehood or their young adulthood? What happened in there? Is there something deep inside that they have not healed from? Or number two, is there something that happened in the marriage that is causing them to do like that? Is it that they don't feel hard? Is it that they are scared of owning up and taking responsibility and saying, hey, I did wrong? What exactly uh, is it? So it'd be wonderful to explore that. It's wonderful to explore that. So perhaps when things quiet down, when things cool down, when things settle down, you can first of all start by, I always say this, I always say this, one of the best paths you can have towards getting to your spouse, start with appreciation. Thank you for the years you've been together with me. Thank you for this impact you've had in my life. You know what? I just want to let you know X, Y, Z. You know, I, I noticed something that, you know, like what, what, what makes you, what makes you take off when things get difficult? What makes you things get difficult? What exactly is, how, what, what normally happens? How can I make it easier for you? How do you find it easy to talk to me? How can we have difficult conversations where you feel safe? So when things settle, perhaps you can consider doing that. And if when things settle, perhaps you can also consider going for counseling, especially together as a couple. I cannot um, overestimate the importance of counseling in terms of understanding each other because counseling can reveal to you your blind spots. Sometimes you can be so focused on seeing things from your own perspective, you don't see your spouse's perspective. And so counseling will help you to understand and hear each other. It's not just for going when things are difficult. It's also for to build understanding. Very, very important. Somebody has said, I have concrete evidence that my spouse is cheating. However, I have and continue to trust God for a breakthrough the way he came through Isaac in Abimelech's situation. Though sometimes I feel like doing something extraordinary since I see this is going on and on and on. Please advise because it's emotionally draining seeing them conversing all day. Yet when I try a conversation, it's like I get a cold reception. Very, very important question that actually you've, uh, you've asked and you're a gentleman. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you as a man for caring so much for your marriage and for your family and for you know extending grace to your wife despite what it is that you know about your wife. Now, what I'll, what I'll request is perhaps consider a few things. Number one, look back at your history, the history of your marriage. When you started off this marriage, when you were dating, were things close between you two? Were things good between you two? If yes, when did the change start? Did it start perhaps during pregnancy? Did it start perhaps when there's friction? Did it start when there was a financial challenge? 
Did it start when you drifted apart and you're not spending so much time together? Did it start, uh, you know, what, when, when exactly did it start? Did it start perhaps when she started hanging around with different friends? Did it start perhaps when she, you know, uh, maybe she started getting more money and felt now I can do whatever it is that I want? Did it start after an argument? You had an argument that was unresolved. What exactly happened? So look back and find out the history of the genesis of this particular thing. Then the next thing, as I've said, always appreciation. Try to appreciate your spouse. Thank you so much for what it is that you do and all that kind of stuff. I see you. You compliment, you give a compliment here and there. I know it is difficult, especially when you know what it is that your wife is doing, that your wife is actually engaged in this thing. But the reason why for doing that is I, I believe when you're writing this, you've chosen option three to, re, to heal, um, repair, and nurture the marriage. So if that's the case, pull your spouse close to you. So now once your spouse is getting close to you, now you start, first of all, the conversation. What is so great about our marriage? You know, you just have a light conversation. Don't make it so structured as if it's an NGO boardroom conversation. Let it just flow freely, you know. You start to have a conversation. What, what do you love about our marriage? So you're like, okay, I love this. I love that. I love perhaps our children. I love that we've got investments. I love that. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. And what areas would you like us to improve our marriage? You know, is it perhaps in terms of sex? Is it perhaps in terms of communication? Let her speak her perspective that I, perhaps we can improve over here. And then you speak your perspective. And then the next thing, you, and then you also contribute now you, your areas where you, you feel like your marriage can improve. And then the next thing that perhaps you can also get to ask is, uh, love languages. What is your love language? If you want to simplify it, you can use a common love language, but it doesn't have to be restricted to that. But let's just use a simplified way because there, uh, there are five clustered love languages. Is it acts of service whereby your spouse enjoys stuff being done to him or her? Is it, uh, is it a gift where your spouse loves being gifted? Is it physical touch where your spouse loves being touched? Is it a quality time where your spouse feels like, hey, when you spend time with me, I feel good. I feel good. You know what? Um, is, it, is it words of affirmation? Being told, hey, you're beautiful. You're, you're good looking. You're, you're amazing. I celebrate you. I treasure you. I'm proud of you. And then once your spouse has answered that question, ask, do you feel like you've been loved in the way you'd want to be loved in this marriage? So now your spouse says, you know what? I feel like I've not been getting so much of words of formation. I feel like I've not been getting so much of this and this and that. So you look at also that. And then we also look at if there's anything that you feel like your, your spouse has a grievance on you about. Perhaps your spouse feels like, hey, you've been speaking to me in a demeaning way. Apologize. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. The strategy is this. You're pulling your spouse closer to you. You're making the marriage more attractive than anything that else that is outside over there. Because if outside over there, all she's getting perhaps is an emotional connection that they can get to laugh and all that kind of stuff. You're showing her, or if if, if, if a particular case, the, the example is uh, him, you're showing your spouse that, hey, we can have that in our marriage. We can have that at home. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, especially when you know what you know. It's not going to be easy, but it's a strategy to use when you choose to heal, uh, repair, and nurture the marriage. Something to consider for further or in-depth, uh, uh, you know, understanding of it. Perhaps something that's custom made. You might even perhaps consider therapy, whether for yourself or together as a couple. And when you're going for therapy as a couple, don't put it as we're going for therapy because you're the problem. Your spouse will will struggle to come for therapy when they feel like they're going for therapy to be accused. Let your spouse feel like, hey, we're going for therapy to build and nurture the love that we have. Uh, and then uh, somebody else is writing, anyone with a WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp link for the group? Yes, the WhatsApp link is going to be posted on the, on, on the, on the messages, on the comment section of the Zoom. Uh, once you see the WhatsApp link, come kindly click on that link and join the WhatsApp group. That's where you're going to be finding uh, PDF copies of our lessons. You're going to be seeing links to the videos for future references or for past videos. You're going to get access to that and also content over there. Uh, what if your spouse doesn't want to have any form of communication, even when you're uh, uh, when you're discussing any other topic? Uh, there could be there could be two reasons. There could be uh, actually a number of reasons. Number number one, your spouse perhaps has has checked out emotionally, so they've just checked out emotionally. They just they're just not in the marriage. Uh, it could be that, or it could be that your spouse has a certain grievance against you. There's something that has not been resolved. There's a pain that your spouse is feeling that has yet to be resolved. There's an apology your spouse is waiting for. So just look back and find out if there's something that actually has been said or done, uh, you know what, apologize, apologize. Or it could be number three, your spouse feels like whenever we have conversations, it, they have to go your way 
or it leads to, you know what, me feeling attacked or it, lead, it goes ugly. So whenever that happens, and this is especially for, for men, when men feel like, okay, it's going to go like that particular direction. So they end up like checking out. So it could be that. I'm not saying it is that. It could be that. Or it could be number four, find conversations or topics that your spouse likes. Even if you don't like the topic, for example, like let's say your spouse likes cars. You don't particularly like cars, but okay, let's go with that. Let's go with that. And you talk about that in such a way that you, you don't, it, it doesn't come off as fake. It comes off as you being, you know, you, you, you want to talk about it. Or let's say the conversation your spouse perhaps enjoys. For example, if it's a husband and then your wife likes to talk about makeup or about wigs or whatever, it's, it's totally not what you're used to. But you're like, for the sake of just showing your spouse, you know what, um, we can talk about this kind of stuff. You start to en engage your spouse in conversations that he or she likes. So you can be able to, you can be able to do that. Somebody says, thank you for the presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that feedback. How can I inbox a quiz? Somebody asking, uh, I believe uh, you've already done that if you haven't yet. Uh, awesome presentation. Thank you. Somebody else is saying, somebody else is saying, thank you. Oh my goodness. Wow. Thank you so much for the appreciation. Thank you so much for the acknowledgement. I have been drained emotionally for being blamed of my hobbies uh, cheating. Thank you for teaching us to forgive. May God give me the grace. I feel I'm losing it, but it is possible to make this marriage work. Thank you. Please, please don't rely on your own strength. It is not easy. It is not easy. Uh, sometimes also the thing about infidelity is because it, it can hurt because if we put so much trust on our spouse and sometimes failing to realize that our spouse are human. They can, they can hurt us and damage us. And the good thing is that God can heal us. God can heal us and also our spouse. So may we, may we, may we, may grace be abound in our marriages. Uh, somebody else, say, else says, thank you for your special messages. So enriching what happens in a scenario, the cheating led to a child being born. Now, thank you so much for this question. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you so much for this question. Now, when, um, when it leads to, uh, when, when it leads to a child, because it does happen, it does happen. The cheating, your spouse may be cheated and it led to a child. Even in that situation, you remember you have got the three options. Maintain the status quo, uh, end the marriage because you're like, okay, I cannot do this, I'm done. Or heal, uh, repair and nurture the marriage. If you've chosen to heal, repair and nurture the marriage, just accept it. You know what? I'm still accepting my spouse for cheating. There is a, there is a, there is a child. So you, 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 there's a child. So especially if your spouse has chosen, okay, we are repairing the marriage. You agree, we are repairing the marriage, and because you are a responsible man, or uh, if, for example, if 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 the if the if it's the man, the husband who cheated, you're a responsible husband, and you're like, okay, because you're a responsible uh, father. Now well, let's find a way to be there for this child. You know, and we come up with mechanisms of how you're going to go about it, how you're going to be there for this baby mama. It's the same way that you'll operate as if you, you're getting married to your husband who already had a child. So you're like, okay, how do you go about it? Let, let be communicating with the baby mama in an openly way. I know what is happening. If you're, uh, if, if you're, if you're sending, if you're sending the money, let's, let, let me be able to know. Let's have that conversation. Now, if it is the wife who cheated and now she's gotten pregnant, now that one, you have to, if you've decided as a husband, I am going to stay and I'm going to heal, repair and nurture this marriage. You just accept it. You're like, okay, uh, we're going to, you're going to carry this pregnancy to term. You give birth to the child. I have chosen to stay in this marriage. We're going to go for therapy on how to handle this unique situation. Uh, I am going to forgive you. Uh, we're going to extend grace to this innocent person. And you agree. Does the man who is the biological father of this child, does he remain in the picture? And if he does, now we are like, okay, so I'll be with this, this particular child will be in our house. I know perhaps they in our house for the first, especially for the first three uh, years when the child is very dependent on the mother. What happens after that? Does the child still continue staying in our house? Or do you perhaps, uh, you know, co-parent with the, with, the, with the father? Or what do you do? Or does, does the child now go to stay with the biological father when the child is grown and then we only just be seeing him or her on some time? So you agree. Remember, this only works when you've chosen option three, to heal, repair, and nurture. It is not easy, but it is doable. You have to come to the place of acceptance that, hey, I, I, I have grieved the season that we had in our marriage. That season is lost. Now we're entering into a new season whereby we're now operating with different dynamics and factors at play. There's a child or children involved. There's somebody else who's a biological father to this child, and we have to agree we are making this thing work. 
And hopefully, as you're doing this, the person who's cheated, the spouse who's, who is guilty of cheating, will take up responsibility and seek to repair the marriage. Remember, this is option three, only works when the person is choosing to repair. But if you are that individual, you've cheated, and then you there, you're tough, you're like, I can do whatever it is that I want, I'm not going to stop being with this woman, I'm not going to be this man, you're not helping option three. And most likely what you're going to get is option two. So very, 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 be very, very careful. How do you safeguard marriage in long distance, especially in countries where Kenyans are few and tend to revolve around each other, especially during social functions, interactions, also where they have adopted sexual promiscuity, fluidity, because spouses are far, so they take advantage of the lack of sex. Very good question. This is the reality of today's uh, situation, where you can be with a spouse long distance. Now, just because people are doing it doesn't mean we also do it. So they are doing it. Okay, they've chosen that. Remember how Joshua said, choose today what you're going to do. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. So if other people are doing it, that's on them. How I choose it and my spouse, we are doing it, we're like, okay, we are remaining com committed. And if you're going to do that, guess what? You're doing marriage or a relationship during a time whereby you have technology. You can be video calling each other many times during the day. You can be bonding. You can be flirting with each other. You can be seducing each other, perhaps even on the phone. Oh my goodness, I just miss. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to be to be next to you. I'm counting down. It's five months until I see you. When I see you, there's things I'm going to do for you, whatnot. You can be praying together. You can be doing uh, games together. You can be doing quizzes together. You can be sharing photos and videos together. The thing is, take advantage of technology to bond, to interact, to connect, to have fun. Don't be serious. Don't just talk about bills, responsibilities. So and so has died. I'm waiting for the funeral. So and so has given birth. No, no, no. Laugh, bond. When you, the thing up, the thing that makes you know faithfulness easier is when there's an emotional bond. When you focus on that emotional bond, even through the distance. Be, re, remember this: you can be living in the same house with somebody that you're not emotionally bonded with, but you can be far away, kilometers apart from somebody, and you are still emotionally bonded with that person. And once you're emotionally bonded. Guess what? The that 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 temptation of let me just look for somebody to 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 do something to me will actually minimize. So work on that emotional bond. It is very possible, not easy, but possible. How can I continue to connect with your ministry and participate with your teaching seminars? Thank you so much. Kindly click on the WhatsApp link that is on the message section of the messages on Zoom. Once you join the WhatsApp group, there you shall be getting the links and any content that you will be needing. Um, so somebody else says, good evening, sir. My husband has been cheating for so long. Problem is I have been forgiving him, but we don't resolve the issue every time. We sweep our problems under the carpet. This has unfortunately affected our marriage badly, emotionally and sexually. We are not connecting anymore. I try to talk to my husband for us to seek help by counseling, but he says it will not help. How do I deal with this kind of a situation? How do I rebuild my marriage? We've already looked at what the other person needs to do, and the one who's been treated on needs to do, but sometimes your spouse might be uh, might be failing you. So for example, if your spouse is saying, you know what, as counseling might not help, you can, you can ask your spouse. Remember the same question that I actually told, uh, that strategy that I said before, appreciate your spouse, first of all, ask your spouse what you love about the marriage, then your spouse says what they love about the marriage, ask your spouse what areas can we improve, and then your spouse communicates, you can improve in this particular area, and then you communicate with the areas that can be improved, and then also ask about the love languages, how would you want to be loved, and then your spouse answers that, and then you communicate how you want to be loved, and then if there's any area where you've actually hurt your spouse, also you apologize, hey, I'm sorry for this, and then your spouse also gets to apologize. You, you, you tend to, you start to look at your spouse, not based on the historical manners that he or she has behaved, but from a new perspective. Behold, I am doing a new thing, says the Lord. Don't you perceive it? Like perceive the newness, perceive the newness. Uh, you perceive the newness. So very, very important. Uh, very, very important uh, for you to actually check on that. Uh, uh, so somebody has said, so I've been told that you have lost me. Can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me now? I'm hoping that I, I'm clear. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, because I've just seen that it's been written that you had lost. I don't know what had happened to the signal. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, 
So uh, what if your spouse doesn't want uh, any form of communication? Oh yeah, I've already answered that. Uh, let me go to this one. Yes, if my spouse likes to celebrating me by, by posting my, my photos on social media with nice messages, which I'm not comfortable as I like private life. But if you have a small issue the following day, she pulls them down and posts something that hurts me. I don't cheat on her and neither uh, I have uh, never suspected her. I don't like. Uh, very, very, uh, very, very good question. You're saying that your spouse celebrates you, celebrates you on social media, says nice things. Uh, you don't like it when you're being, uh, you're not comfortable with that because you like a private life. Uh, and then when you have a small issue, the following day she pulls them down. Uh, this is sometimes part of uh, this is sometimes part of maturity. Your perhaps your your wife is going through a journey of maturity. Eventually, she will outgrow these kind of behaviors. Now, maybe perhaps what it is that you can consider doing is. When she celebrated you, babe, that's her way of showing you love. I know you may perhaps uh, not like it. You can be like, okay, thank you so much. You know, it, I, I read that post that you wrote about me. Uh, it felt very, it's 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 very nice. It's uh, thank you so much for writing that about me. Uh, it it feels it feels good knowing that that's how you view me. So you start to appreciate that. And then when you start noticing that, okay, she pulls them down. You know what? It's it, you just go like, okay, it's your wall. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, put uh, put them up and do all kind of stuff, you know what? It's up to you. But when things are easier, when you two get, get to make things, when you, get, when you get to make things right, when you get to be in a good standing, then you can let her know, okay, so my wife, when things are difficult in our marriage, when you're going through issues, how do we address it? So you ask her that question, how do you want to address it? So she tells you, okay, I'd uh, like it perhaps when you hug me, I'd like it you apologize, I'd like it you tell me X, Y, Z, I'd like it that you gift me. So she's sharing her, her thoughts. Once she shared her thoughts, now you share your thoughts. Myself also, I will appreciate if you don't, you know, uh, perhaps post me on social media. I'll appreciate if we, you know, we steer clear from involving the public. I'll appreciate if you, if you, if we have a conversation, talk to me even if you're mad. So the strategy is you let your spouse share their opinion and then you give yours. It works better like that when you're allowing your spouse to share the opinion first and then you give. So when things are good, have that conversation, have that conversation. So now she can be able to communicate how she wants things to be addressed when things are difficult. And then also you get to address how you want things to be addressed and also what not to do when things are difficult. That's a very, very good way um, of approaching it. Uh, I believe we have finished the ones over here. And then somebody else is saying, uh, thanks so much. My wife has been recording all my calls, SMSs, and WhatsApp chats for the last three years, three years, which I knew last week. She has been saying that I have multiple partners. These are my friends. She has already separated herself. I am sorry so much for that. I, I can imagine how that is painful. I can imagine how that is painful. Perhaps maybe what you're talking, it could be what we're dealing with is perceived infidelity. Remember what it is that we saw earlier, perceived infidelity. Could it be that perhaps there was some point in time, maybe three years back, you you were perhaps talking or uh, behaving in a manner that yes, you are not you are not cheating, but your spouse ended up perceiving that. If that is the case, we've talked about what to do when there is perceived infidelity. So perhaps you can just go back to the pointers over there and see what to do. One, two, three, the kind of stuff that you can get to do, and you can get perhaps some 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 support over there. And if if in case you need further support. Uh, perhaps you can consider cancelling somebody else. Oh, oh the, uh, we reshare the, the link to the WhatsApp. Somebody else says we can reshare the link to the WhatsApp. Yes, it's just going to be shared uh, on the messages. Please feel free to click on the link to join our WhatsApp group. Somebody else says the lady who says she's blamed for her husband's infidelity, could you link it up for support? I'm in the same space too. He cheated in 2021. It was blamed on me. He still keeps a, a, a lady as a confidant, even when I have expressed disapproval, still reaches out to his ex, not the cheating partner. I think my reaction has been the phone, but feels like I'm a mess, I'm, I'm messed up inside. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this, uh, for, 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 for this uh, vulnerable sentiment that I actually put out. And I can imagine how painful it is where your spouse cheats on you and then blames you for cheating. It was wrong, it was wrong, but you know what? I think when such a thing happens, you're like, okay, uh, I cannot I cannot force my spouse not to tell me I was not the problem. Okay, if, if my spouse is still digging in and saying that I was the problem, okay. Now, whatever has happened in the past, 
it has happened. Whatever has happened in the past, it has happened. How can we try to repair and build this marriage? So one of the things, in fact, one of the things that holds marriage well together is an emotional connection. And from what I'm, what I'm seeing over here, your, your, your husband has a lady confident, meaning he's emotionally confiding in somebody else. And then he reaches out also to a chitty, to, to, to the ex or not a chitty partner. They, I feel like perhaps there's an emotional vacuum that has been created in the union. And it's perhaps it's not even because of you. It's may, maybe even because of him. Now, perhaps the goal should be how can, how can the two of you in your marriage connect well and even better emotionally? Assuming that you have chosen option three, where you choose to heal, uh, repair, and nurture your marriage. Now, unfortunately, the way it might appear is that even though you're the one who's been cheated on, you are the one to do a lot of the work because you're the one who's here, he's not here. If he was here, then he will have, if he's not listening, that is. But if he's listening, I hope that actually he's gotten the point whereby he needs to perhaps get to the point of heal, repair, and nurture. But in case he's not here, then if you're the one who's here, just look for ways of, okay, how can we repair this emotion, emotional bond in our marriage? So one of the things is, Accept the fact that the cheating happened. You know, don't 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 be there and feel like okay, he still blames you for that. You're like, okay, I'm not getting the answer that I want. You still, we're going to move on. We are like, I'm, I've chosen option three to heal, repair, and nurture the marriage. You can go ahead and find those things that you can appreciate about him. Is there any that you've learned from him? Is there any blessing that is given you? Is there any way that has impacted your life? Remember, we are talking about option three because you haven't chosen option two which is ending the marriage. You've chosen option three. Is there anything you can appreciate? So you start to appreciate him. You start to celebrate the marriage and be like, hey, let's have some laughter. Let's have some good time. Let's have conversations in this marriage that are not about issues and problems. It's, that are not about me telling you, why did you not pick up the call? They're not about, why have you come home at this particular time? They're not about, it's uh, uh, happy, joyful, warmer conversations. You try and bond, you try and bring him closer to you. Be more appreciative, be more, conversational in a manner that are easy to talk to, uh, avoid, uh, you know, complaining a lot. And remember, we're looking at a healing strategy. Sometimes in order to heal, you minimize the complaints, you uh, pump up the appreciation, bring the spouse closer to you. Once your spouse has come closer to you, then your spouse, the walls have started to come down. Then you go like, okay, what do we love about our marriage? What can we improve on our marriage? Always start with what do we love about our marriage? What's the good? Before you talk about the bad, start with what is the good. Let him speak about the good. Uh, look back at where it is that you've come from, the victories that you've won, uh, the ways that actually he's done well. If he's been promoted over the years, you're like, hey, you know what? I'm so proud of you as my husband and all that kind of stuff. If he attempts to hug you, be like, I just love the way you hug me. I love your masculine hands on me. You're, you're bringing your spouse closer to you, your husband closer to you. In other words, you're starting to become more and more of your husband's confidant. That way, uh, if he's also chosen option three, the temptation to looking for another confidant outside of the marriage starts to diminish. But again, I insist, this is when it is option three. And I will also say this, whenever you see counseling might be of help, and then your spouse doesn't want to participate in counseling, you don't have to wait for your spouse. Let me break it to you. You can also go to counseling as an individual who is married. There you can be able to vent, talk about your issues, gain perspective, find healing, and even find a unique strategy to deal with your unique situation. So just something for, 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 for us to consider. Uh, somebody else is saying, my first time here tuning in from Dubai. I am thoroughly blessed. Another person is saying, uh, from America. Thank you for what you're doing, sir. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that feedback. Thank you also for, for, tuning, for tuning in. Um, let's, I think somebody else has written something and then we can get to close. Uh, what if your spouse's infidelity led to a baby who needs medical attention outside the country to the point of selling our things in the presence of starting another uh, business? I know that one can hurt. I know that one can hurt. And the tricky part over here is that the baby is innocent, it is your spouse who brought all of this. And it's a very uh, tricky point. Um, sometimes you look at it, uh, one of the ways of looking at it is 
okay, how much support can we be there? Can, 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 can we give there? Okay, if you're going to give this, if you because the baby's life is, is, is in danger and you're like, okay, if you're going to do some financial measures, how much can we take? So it will take, it will have to take some, a lot of cooperation. You extending grace to the limit that it can be given. And then your spouse also acknowledging that, okay, even as you're helping this baby, this innocent child, we are not bank bankrupting ourselves. We are not putting our life at risk. We're not putting our finances at risk. So finding that balance whereby it's great that in case this, the medical attention cannot be gotten in the country that you're in and you need to go and the baby needs to be get, a, get treatment abroad, be like, okay. And sometimes also, if you if you're communicating your limits also you can be able to communicate okay what other options are there and again this is when you've chosen op option three to heal repair and nurture so you have to work at it with when you're very pro marriage you're like okay we will look at it as if let's say this baby my my my, my spouse got married uh, with this particular baby and then i found out that the baby is sick what are what are our limits? And you tell your spouse, okay, this is perhaps is our limit. This is I feel I feel like when we get when we help up until here, it's good. And I offer this kind of suggestions. I offer these uh, ideas, maybe of how we can raise more money for help. Um, somebody has somebody says I went for counseling and I got healed emotionally. Thank you so much for that feedback and just letting us know how counseling was of great impact to you. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, before we conclude, we're just going to pray for everyone who's over here and is going through a difficult situation, or even those who are going to something good. We're not just talking about bad situation, but also marriage has got its good seasons. So tomorrow, please remember to tune in tomorrow for day two. We're going to look at midlife crisis and how it affects marriages. And I'm telling you, the ages of between 35 and 55, that is where a lot of marriages get shaken. Uh, somebody else says, it's just a great blessing hearing all of this before marriage. How God gets me uh, to prepare for marriage to fail in it. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's God. God is preparing you for marriage. Thank you so much, Mr. Dan. I much appreciate. Thank you so much for that feedback. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, whatever, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. Uh, much appreciated. So please remember to join uh, tomorrow, same time, and also uh, on day three, uh, October 3rd, for uh, also uh, the summer seminar. We're going to look at sexually balanced. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for the seasons in marriage, the good and the bad, because marriage is indeed a journey. Thank you, Father, for those ones who are in a good season, who are enjoying growth, enjoying healing, enjoying plenty, enjoying the fruits of their labor, enjoying intentionality, and enjoying love. Indeed, O oh Lord, we don't take that for granted, and we thank you for that blessing. And for those ones who are going through a difficult season, perhaps a, a season of financial distress, perhaps a, a season of infidelity, perhaps a season or just class of external factors, the form of in-laws, parents interfering, perhaps a season or load of misunderstanding and miscommunication, perhaps, oh Lord, a season of difficult health challenges that are weighing uh, down their finances, oh Lord. Lord, we pray that you may be with those couples going through that season. We pray, Father, for anyone here who has been hurting their spouse or anyone who shall watch this video in future online, oh Lord, Lord, may you convict them. Convict them of what they're doing and help them to come to the place of stopping their lifestyle and seeking to heal, repair, and nurture their habit. We pray for any the, 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 the marriage. We pray for anyone who's struggling with a habit that is destroying their marriage, whether it is lust, whether it is pornography, whether it is Lord Jesus Christ, an addiction Lord Jesus Christ to just think about themselves sexually, regardless of what, what is causing their spouse. We pray, Father, for conviction and for victory when it comes to this habit. We also pray, Father, for those ones whose spouse has cheated on them. Help them to find healing. Help them to find grace. Whether it is it has been emotional infidelity, financial infidelity, sexual infidelity, spiritual infidelity, social infidelity, or physical infidelity, we pray, Father, for grace. Help them, Father, to be able to decide, are we maintaining the status quo? Are we ending this marriage or are we building? And if this cho they've chosen to end, oh Lord, give them the, 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 the grace to heal. And if they've chosen also
also to work on the marriage, give them the grace also to navigate the marriage towards healing, to be patient, to extend grace, and to appreciate the fact that it's not going to be easy, O oh Lord. We pray, Father, for the softening of hearts, that, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, husbands and wives shall understand each other. And if there's any way, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, that individuals here have hurt their spouse, O oh Lord, may you teach them to ask for forgiveness, to change their ways, and to be intentional about being there for their spouse. Lord, return back the marriages to their first love. And we pray for those ones here who are not yet married, those ones, whether they are single, they are dating, or in a complicated situation, Lord, may you prepare the path. May you prepare them well, Father, for their future marriage, if indeed marriage is what they seek, O oh Lord. May you be able to pair them and nurture them and grow them a good foundation leading to marriage. We thank you, O oh Lord, even as you meet again tomorrow for day two and the next day for day three in accordance to your will, that indeed, O oh Lord, we trust that you shall walk with us and be with us. Receive all the glory and all the honor. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed, trusting and believing. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. See you tomorrow for day two. Same time. Same time. Whatever it is that you're tuning in, God bless you. And thank you very much once again.